you so very much for tuning in here today at Church on the Rock. If this is your first time, let me encourage you to go to JesusOfTheRock.org. There you can find out all sorts of information on our ministries, or you can give to our church financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Again, thank you for joining us, and welcome to Church on the Rock. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 14. You really don't need your Bible for this. If you've been in church at all, you know the verse. If my people, everybody say my people. Whose people? God's people. God's speaking. He said, if my people, not the world, not the president, not the government, not the media, not Hollywood, if my people, I'm going to talk to my people, God said. If my people who are called by my name. You call yourself Christian. You you call yourself. So if you're called by my name, you're using my name, you're walking and you're representing me in the earth. You're my people and you're called by my name. If you will humble yourself, If we have to humble ourselves, that means the Lord sees there's some pride going on, right? If you will humble yourself, number one, and pray. Don't talk about prayer. Don't preach about prayer. Don't sing about prayer. Pray. If you'll humble yourself and pray and seek my face, not just my hands, not just what I can do for you, seek my face. And if you will turn from your wicked ways, God sees something's not right. Wicked ways. Wicked. I've taught you before that wicked comes from the root word wick, which means to twist, like wicker furniture, like a candle wick is twisted. He says, you've gotten twisted in your thinking. There's something in the church that's gotten twisted today. He says, you got to turn from your twisted way. You got to untwist this thing. You got to get lined up. Something is twisted in the way you're doing business. Turn from your wicked, twisted ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive your sins and I will heal your land. I'll heal your land. I'll heal your land. God spoke to Solomon way back in the day, and said to him, hey, Solomon, whenever there's trouble in the land, whether there's there's drought or there's locusts or there's pestilence or disease, whenever your land gets sick, here's the remedy. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, wash it away, and I will heal their land. It intrigues me. He doesn't say we need to get all the heathen saved. He didn't say if my people will go out and attack all the evil in the world. He didn't say if my people would go out and pick it and protest and politic about everything that we disagree with. He said if your land is sick and in need of healing, whether your land is your home, whether your land is your church, your body, your family, your finances, your mind, whatever land is sick, then the solution is still the same. I want you to humble yourself and pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. I will. When he says I will, he means I will. Not I might, not I'll think about it. I will forgive your sin and I'll heal your land. I will heal your land. You see, it makes good sermons to stand up here and criticize the president and the Congress and the Senate and the Republicans and the Democrats and the liberal media and Hollywood and Disney World and everybody else. That makes good sermons because they're easy targets. But according to God and his word, neither the problem or the solution is in the hands of the government, the media, or the world. But both the problem, yeah, the problem and the solution lies in the hands of God's people. God's people. It's so easy for us to find someone to point a finger at, isn't it? Anytime we have a problem, anytime we get confronted, anytime we we find ourselves something wrong, it's so easy for us to point our finger and say, it's their fault. 
It's the president's fault. It's the media's fault. It's the liberal this. It's Hollywood's fault. It's this one's fault. It's that one's fault. It's everybody's fault. This thing is as old as creation itself. God comes to Adam and says, Adam, what's up? I said you could eat of every tree in the garden, but this one tree you don't eat of. Did you eat of it? Adam took it like a man, blamed his wife. Right? Hey, it's not me, Lord. It's this woman you gave me. He didn't just blame his wife. He blamed God. You're the one brought her in here. I was doing fine. It's this woman you gave me. So God says, Eve, what about it? Eve said, the devil made me do it. Wasn't my fault. The devil made me do it. This is as old as creation itself. This, this thing has its roots back in creation. And we've never stopped. It's so easy for us to place the blame. Blame him, blame her, blame anybody. Just don't blame me. Blame my husband, blame my wife. If he were a better husband, I would. If she were a better wife, I could. It's my boss. I mean, you know me. I'm a swell guy. Till I get around him, he drives me nuts. It's my kids. It's, my, it's the neighborhood which I grew up in. That's why if I grew up in your neighborhood, of course I would be fine. Church, the time has come when judgment must begin at the house of God. Judgment must begin. 1 Peter 4, 17 said the time has come for judgment and it must begin in God's house. In God's house. We have to first take responsibility for our own situation. Listen to me. Jesus is not going to have a bride that's, he's not coming back for a prostitute. He said, I'm coming back for a bride without spot or without wrinkle. I'm not coming back to marry a whore. I'm not coming back to marry, uh, you know, the, he said, I'm coming back to gather together my bride. And when he does that, the church is going to consist of a group of fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. People who are committed and sold out to Christ. And I am convinced the purifying process is underway. So what do God's people need to do? What is this great sin that's plaguing the church anyway? Well, some say, well, we can't isolate it down to one particular sin, but I think we really can because I firmly believe that most, if not all, sin stems from and is rooted in one particular sin. It's the original sin. Before Adam and Eve, before the garden, before creation, Lucifer, the highest and most revered of all God's angels, committed this sin. I still haven't figured out why anybody could worship the devil. Now, I'm a Satan worshiper. I'm the, the devil couldn't stay saved when there was no devil. You talk about a loser, and this is who you're going to worship? But he committed the sin of pride. The pride, I'm going to be as God. I'm going to be better than God. Think about it. It's the sin behind the sin. If I commit murder, it's because I think more highly of myself than I do that person's life I'm taking. If I steal from this person or, uh, you know, if I rape this person, if I do, I'm saying by my actions, I deserve whatever I can get. It's all about I. Pride, it's the sin behind the sin. It's the sin that's destroying the church today. It's no wonder God would speak through the prophet Solomon and say, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, will humble themselves. The, the very first thing he calls on us to do is humble ourselves. Jesus would later echo this in the New Testament. He said, and he lines them out. He says, there are seven things that God hates. The first one is a proud look. He said God hates that stuff. He hates that. I mean, when you look and you say, okay, I want to please God. Seven things God hates. The first one, proud look. All right, I need to deal with that. God has not called us, church, to be the religious police. He doesn't need us out here running around like spiritual vigilantes, picketing and protesting and politicking against everything we disagree with. Church people have gotten so busy pulling the splinters out of everybody's eye that we have neglected the log in our own eye. Jesus said it like this. He said, you gag at a gnat while you swallow a camel. You're out here.
you're dealing with these things that irritate you. You're dealing with these things that rub you the wrong way. You're dealing with these things that you don't necessarily agree with. You don't even see that the more you deal with that, the bigger the camels in your life get. The bigger the, bigger the logs are in your eye. He told, that's why he told a group of church people one time, and I love it. He said, I assure you, I promise you, I swear to you, even the publicans and the prostitutes will go into heaven before you do. Oh my God. What? These are church people. And he said, the crooked, thieving tax collectors and the prostitutes are going to make it to heaven. Why? Because he said, they have a problem. Don't, don't get me wrong. They got, they got issues with their flesh. They got greed and they got lust and they got, they got problems with their flesh. But here's the difference. They're sick, but they know they're sick. Nobody has to tell them they're rotten. Nobody has to tell them they're sick. Nobody has to tell them they have a problem. The problem with you is you're sick and you don't even know you're sick. He echoed it again in Revelation. He said that you, you say that I'm well and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and you don't even know that you're sick and lonely and broken. You're, you're, he said you're wretched and miserable, and the problem is not that you're wretched, miserable, and sick. The problem is you're wretched, miserable, and sick and don't know it. You're walking around so proud, so arrogant, and you're, you're looking at all the things that irritate you, and you're looking at the tax collectors, and you're looking at the prostitutes, and you're looking at the homosexuals, and you're looking at this agenda, and you're looking at this, and you're looking at that, and you're pulling splinters out. He said, you got logs. They, yeah, they're dealing with their flesh, but he says, you're dealing with the bad stuff like pride and arrogance and, and these things that are huge. You're sick and don't know you're sick. It's so easy, and this is where the Lord really started getting on me because this is where I struggle. It's so easy for us to blame the president or the Congress or the Senate. And it's easy for me to do that because there's so many things that I so strongly disagree with them on. There's so many things but I also know this. I know how many nights I lay my head on the pillow and I lay there awake at night thinking about this church, thinking about the future of this church, the finances of this church, everything that deals with it, people that are leaving, people that are, are, are broken here, things that need to be done. I lay there and I think about this because I know at the end of the day, the buck stops here. I know that it's a responsibility I have, and I know how much it weighs on me, but I cannot even imagine laying down at night and, 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 and trying to sleep with the weight of an entire nation on your shoulders. I cannot even imagine to know that no matter what you do, at least half the nation will criticize you and condemn you for it. Because that's the nature of the beast. That's the nature of our nation. We're so polarized and split. And I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican. It makes no difference to me to know that on any given day, the actions of some mad dictator can hurl you into nuclear holocaust in World War III. To know that you're only one bad decision away from utter destruction. Yeah, it's heavy. It's heavy. So, Lord, let me go ahead and just get in your business the way you got in my business. Let me ask you the question the Lord asked me. When is the last time you prayed for your president? I said, Lord, let's talk about something else. I didn't say prayed about him. I said prayed for him. When's the last time you prayed for your leaders in this country? Have you ever other than some prayer rally or something where it all sounds good. Have you ever humbled yourself and got in your prayer closet and prayed for your president and your leaders and your Congress and your Senate and your mayors and your, your all? Have you prayed? Have you even prayed? But you're going to talk about what everybody is doing wrong? When is the last time? What have you spent more time doing, complaining, griping, or praying? Politicking or praying, judging or praying. 
So you don't have to agree with their decisions. Pray for them anyway. That doesn't mean you agree with them. If you don't agree with them, that's even more reason. It is a true test of your Christian character to pray for someone you disagree with. Anybody can pray for somebody that you love and you just want, think they're wonderful. And we all, yeah, we can pray for them. But can you pray for somebody you disagree with? Not about them, for them. Lift them up every day in prayer. You may be surprised how much it'll lift you up also. How much it'll begin to change you also. You can heal your own land when you humble yourself and pray and seek his face and turn from your wicked ways. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, pray, pray. If you weren't here Wednesday night, which most of you weren't, there was only about 20 here, so I'm going to recap it for you real quick, about 30 seconds. Because I shared with them Wednesday night that I had talked with someone and they were saying, thank you for all you've done for my family and this, that, and the other. And I said to them, I said, all I did was just pray for them. And they said, well, thank you anyway. And I get back I get back into my little office, and God jumped on me. The Holy Spirit jumped on me with both feet, and he said, I don't want to ever, ever, ever hear you say again that all you did was pray for somebody. I don't want to ever hear you say, all we can do now is pray. He said, don't you ever diminish the power of my prayer. Don't you know that you unleash heaven and earth when you pray? Don't you know you unleash the Holy Spirit? And then he said this, and this one's the one really got me. He said, listen to me. I take your prayer seriously, even if you don't. I said, Lord, can we talk about something else? I take your prayer seriously, even if you don't. When you pray, he said, pray in faith. Believing that you receive what you have. Yeah, it's been a tough week. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Stop seeking approval and seek him. Stop seeking applause and seek him. Stop seeking accolades and seek him. God, what is your will for my life? What can you do? Lord, to use me, what can I do? Pray. Seek his face. Oh, yeah, and turn from your wicked, twisted ways. You trying to tell me God's people have wicked ways? <laughs> More wicked than you know. More twisted than we can imagine. What are, what are, what are our wicked ways? What are our twisted ways? The church has become so twisted in our thinking. We've got this good guy, bad guy thing going on. We're the good guys. They're the bad guys. We, 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 even in our so-called good deeds, I think we always try to see ourselves as the good Samaritan, helping the poor old people out of the ditch, never realizing we've become the ones in the ditch. It's us that needs to be pulled out of the muck and mire. It's us that's found ourselves in the ditch. Jesus said, you blind Pharisees, you gag at gnats and swallow camels. You're, 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 you've got these bad things going on in your life. Pride, bitterness, no compassion, unforgiveness. The problem is, if you don't get a hold of this and turn from your twisted ways, it only gets worse. The more religious you get, the worse you get. You got to humble yourself and pray and turn from this wickedness. You got you to gotta change everything. It's not about joining a church. It's not about being baptized. It's not about calling yourself this. You got to change everything if you want your land healed. All right, let me bring this in for a landing. If I haven't got up in your business so far, hang on, because I'm fixing to. Now, I've heard church people for years say things like, America's becoming another Sodom and Gomorrah. And I've even heard church people say this. If God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me say, first of all, Mr. Arrogant, Miss Arrogant, 
That's God you're talking about, and he doesn't have to apologize to anybody. His ways are not your ways, and his thoughts are not your thoughts. However, since we're here, let's take a look at Sodom and Gomorrah and their great sin. Let's take a look at why God destroyed this country and why America maybe should be destroyed. And I'm going to tell you the truth. I agree with you. I agree with you that America is looking more and more like Sodom. And furthermore, I'll tell you this, the church is looking more and more like Sodom. So let me, let me go ahead and tell you what God has to say about Sodom. If you want to read it for yourself, it's in Ezekiel 16, 49. And here's what, here's what it says in Ezekiel 16, 49. Sodom's sins were, are you ready? Sodom's sins were pride, gluttony, and laziness, while the poor and needy suffered outside their door. Wait a minute, where are the homosexuals? Where's all the sin and iniquity and fornication and this lewd living and all this? Yeah, it was there, but that's not why he said he destroyed it. He said, here's what Sodom's sins were. Pride, gluttony, and laziness while the poor and needy suffered outside her door. I guess you're right. We do look like Sodom and Gomorrah. And maybe nowhere more than inside the walls of our church. We're so busy screaming about the abomination of homosexuality and gay marriage and, and adultery and 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 drunkenness and these people they're smoking and drinking and running around and we've neglected to see why God really destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah they were proud fat and lazy they were and they were uncompassionate the poor and needy suffered outside her door so pastor are you condoning gay marriage and this listen I'm not condoning anything I'm not condoning any sin especially my own I'm not, I'm not condoning anything at all. I'm just speaking to the church about the church and pleading with the church, stop being distracted by the sins of the flesh, by the sins of the world. Stop getting upset because the world acts like the world and let's deal with the sins of the heart if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Quit worrying about getting splinters out of people's eye. It's not your business anyway. He said, how many times did he say, judge not? Don't judge other people. Don't. He says, look at your life. He said, the goodness of God leads men to repentance. If my people who are called by my name will humble yourself and pray and seek my face and turn from your wickedness, I will hear from heaven. Forgive your sin and I'll heal your land. What is your land? What is your land that's sick? What part of your land do you need God to heal? Your finances? Your body? Your family? A relationship? In the church. In the church. How much bitterness and unforgiveness do we carry around and hide up under these suits and coats and pretty dresses? How much gossip and nastiness and prejudice? Everybody's segregating. The schools segregate. Walmart segregates. The whole world's segregating. And the church still has white church, black church, this church, that church. And so much of the church is perfectly okay with that. Well, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not satisfied with white church and black church and rich church and poor church and this kind of church and that kind of church. I want a church that looks like heaven. I want a church where all God's people come together. Rich people, poor people, black people, white people, red people, green people, Mexican people, Ben, I got you covered. I want, I want a church where everybody comes together and says, I'm his people. I'm his people. And you know what? It's time for me to humble my proud self and seek his face and turn from my stinking thinking ways. 
Repent and ask God to heal our land. Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Thank him this morning. Amen. Bow your heads with us. God, you are so good. You are so patient and long-suffering and full of mercy. It's true, Lord. As you look at the church today, Lord, I, I see worse than Sodom. Proud, lazy, fat, and satisfied while people outside our door starve to death. And us never care. All we want to do is fix everybody. We want everybody to look like us and talk like us and vote like us and act like us. And us is so sick. Heal our land. Heal our land. And we know the time of judgment is here and judgment must begin in the house of God. We're dragging up the rear, God. The world is, is open arms and accepting of people, and the church still blocks them out. We're a white church. We're a black church. We're a Pentecostal church. We're a Baptist church. We're a Methodist church. Who said? When did you start saying you have the right to form a little clique and make you a little doctrine and set up your little rules and not care about the world? God forgive us. God have mercy on us, sinners. Please heal our land. Heal our land. Heal our land. We want to be the bride without spot or without wrinkle, God. We don't want you to come back and us be so dirty, God, that we've looked to our own devices. We've created our own image of you. We say what you're supposed to do. You could apologize. You should do this. God does this. God understands me. God, what, where have we gone? You're holy. You are. We, we, our ways are not your ways. Our thoughts, we just submit ourselves under your holy hand and say, teach us. And Lord, when you correct us, we say, thank you for loving us. Thank you for not letting me continue down this road. Again, we're so incredibly glad you decided to join us here today at Church on the Rock. Now, if this message blessed you in any way, let us hear about it. You can email pray at jesusoftherock.org or you can look us up on Facebook or Twitter, Church on the Rock, Pascagoula. Now, I pray that God shows you awesome ways to apply this message to your everyday life.